Hey guys, everything we use now was all once invented. Even if it didn't look quite the way we're used to, we still shouldn't forget those freaks. After all, without them, there would be nothing today. You would have never had a chance to even watch this video on your smartphone if Martin Cooper, in his time, hadn't invented this thing, a cell phone. The idea of a cell phone has been around since 1946, when Motorola and AT&T launched the first commercial mobile telephone service, MTS. Later, the AT&T company invented the cells, thereby coming out ahead in this battle. Finally, on April 3, 1973, the inventor Martin Cooper, who worked for Motorola, grabbed his invention and called his competitor, the head of the AT&T research department, Joel Angel. Hello? Yes, who is this, Martin? Is that you? Guess what I'm calling from? Uh, so what from? I'm calling you from a real cell phone. Oh, you son of a! That was the first call made from the first Dynatac cell phone, which in fact started a new era in telecommunications. Dynatac weighed quite a lot and had a respectable size. And this is not to mention a flexible rubberized antenna. It had 12 keys on its front panel, 10 numeric and 2 for sending a call and ending a conversation. Dynatac didn't have a display or any additional features. It could work for up to 8 hours in standby mode and about 35 minutes in talk mode. But at the same time, it had to be charged for more than 10 hours. But let's not forget that it was a prototype, and the first certified Motorola Dynatac 8000X phone appeared only 10 years later, on September 21st, 1983. You know, all this bureaucracy, you have to sign all those documents. Well, next we have a ballpoint pen. Yes, of course, before the ballpoint pen, everyone wrote with a fountain one. So it's like the first one, but now it's just a luxury. And actually, to write with it, you need to be mega skillful. Much better than a chicken. That's why we have a ballpoint pen in this very place, and not a fountain pen. In short, on October 30th, 1888, in the United States, John Lott patented the very mode of operation of the ballpoint pen. But his invention could only be used to mark rough surfaces, such as leather so it turned out to be too rough for writing. And due to the lack of commercial viability, its potential remained untapped, and the patent eventually became invalid. Then, in 1938, the Hungarian journalist Laszlo Biro noticed that the ink used for printing newspapers dried faster and didn't leave stains, so he decided to use this ink in a fountain pen. But since the ink was too thick, of course he didn't succeed. Then he asked his brother chemist George for help and together they stirred up a type of pen that used a ball. As the pen moved across a surface, the ball rotated and transferred the ink to paper. They failed to patent it for the same reason. And then the war began, and they eventually went to Argentina and patented their innovation there. At the same time, the pilots of the Royal Air Force of Great Britain were like, damn, due to the decrease in atmospheric pressure when gaining altitude, our ordinary fountain pens leak in planes, and without a pen in flight, we're like without hands. As a result, the British Parliament ordered a huge batch of ballpoint pens, and according to other sources, they even bought the patent rights. After the war, the ballpoint pens saw a boom, and they were selling like hotcakes for $12.50. But it was all about marketing. By the way, then, in 1953, the French Baron Bic, yes, that Bic, who was engaged in the production of ballpoint pens, was like, well, screw those expensive pens, I'll make cheap ones. That's how these very pens that we've known since childhood appeared. But while the pen owes its popularity to World War II, the tanks owe to World War I. After a relatively short initial phase of maneuvering combat operations on the fronts, a balance was established, the so-called trench war. In short, whoever is in the trench has an advantage. It makes no sense to attack such people. The artillery couldn't help either, because only God knows where to shoot. And after the artillery strikes, even the fellow troops couldn't walk across and drive across the boomed places. And this means you need to come up with something new. With high cross-country capability, preferably on a tracked chassis, and with great firepower and good protection. And that thing was a tank. By the way, tank comes from the English word tank, which means a canister or cistern, a reservoir. And all this was to misinform the enemy agents. 
who monitored the troop and weapons movements by rail. When the first tanks were sent to the front, the British counterintelligence spread a rumor that the Tsarist government had ordered a batch of fuel tanks in England, and the tanks went by rail under the guise of cisterns. Fortunately, the gigantic size and shape of the first tanks corresponded well to this version. They even wrote on them in Russian, Caution Petrograd. That's how the name eventually stuck. So the first tank was the British Mark I, which was divided into a male and a female, and later a hermaphrodite appeared. And the Germans, of course, pooped their pants. And though in fact Mark I wasn't a perfect vehicle, so the French decided to make their own tank the second in history and the first successful light tank, the Renault FT. This was the first tank with a rotating turret, with a light cannon or a machine gun installed in it, as well as a low ground pressure and, as a result, high cross-country ability, relatively high speed and good maneuverability. All this later became a classic set of tank construction. The next invention is karaoke. In 1971, Japanese drummer Daisuke Inui played in different clubs in the evenings. But since the drum kit can't always be squeezed onto the stage, Daisuke had to master the synthesizer, and the problem seemed to be solved, but no luck. At that time, the Japanese were very fond of singing to live music in clubs, and therefore every time they asked for more and more new songs. And due to the fact that Daisuke fell from the second floor at the age of three and a half and bumped his head, he had trouble remembering things, and the new songs were more and more often confused with old ones. And then he came up with the idea to record the backing tracks of some songs, and as if playing, sing to them. But his plan didn't go any further than that. Until one fine moment, a familiar entrepreneur approached him. Daisuke, help me out. I'll close the deal today, so we'll go get drunk in the evening, and they will 100% make me sing. And you, like no one else, know what songs I can sing without any problems. And then Daisuke recorded a couple of songs on a tape recorder in the keynotes that suited him best. A couple of days later, an old acquaintance came back and asked if he could record some more songs for him. And then it dawned on him. Ah. If you throw money into the machine with a microphone, speaker and an amplifier, and it plays, and you can sing what you want, genius! And it really worked, though not immediately, as at first no one knew what kind of machines stood in the corner of the establishments, and when they found it out, they were afraid to use them. Then Daisuke asked a familiar pretty singer to go to these clubs and sing a couple of songs on them. And it worked! People started to come out and sing too, and they still do it. And to kick some hay, the smart-ass Japanese stirred up such a thing. He set up the machines so that they played for 5 minutes for 100 yen. At that time, it was about a third of a dollar. And the average song lasted for 3 minutes. So it turns out that in order to finish the second song, you had to add another buck. And the money started pouring in. By the way, according to the public opinion poll in Japan, karaoke was ranked second among the Japanese inventions of the 20th century. But the first place was undoubtedly won by instant noodles. Its creator, the Japanese Momofuku Ando, always dreamed of feeding all hungry Japanese people in the post-war period with fast, tasty and, most importantly, cheap food. Because, as he said, peace will come to the world when the people have enough food to eat. Throughout the year, he tried to come up with a suitable way to dry the noodles, but nothing worked. The cooked noodles had neither the desired texture nor taste. But then one day, just by accident, he dipped some noodles into the hot butter that his wife had prepared for the upcoming dinner. The result was excellent. Noodles not only got dry, but also became slightly porous. This gave the desired effect when soaked in hot water afterwards. As a result, at the age of 48, he became an inventor and manufacturer of the dish that later became an inspiration symbol for Japan. Then he decided to feed the rest of the world, too. And of course, he started with the States which somehow reacted not very well. What? Damn! To eat it, you need to cook it in a saucepan for about 5 minutes. And we don't have that much time. And we don't even have a saucepan. Or dishes to eat it later. And we don't know how to cook it at all. So screw those noodles. Then in 1966, Ander noticed that one of the shops which sold his noodles used washed disposable styrofoam coffee cups as dishes. It turned out that they used them simply because they didn't have any other dishes. And then it dawned on Ando that this was a great idea for improving his product. And in five years, the States saw instant noodles in a styrofoam cup, to which you just had to add hot water and wait for a couple of minutes. 
And as you can see now, the success was guaranteed. Hey, why do you only have inventions that were invented by men in your video? Well, it looks like women are not given to invent as much as men. Hey, that's sexist. You want a complaint about the video? Women also come up with a lot of things, probably. So quickly, look for an invention from a woman. Okay, let's see. Nah, well... Men, 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 another man. Men, 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 more men, 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 men. Oh, here. Mary Anderson's windshield wipers. Well, come on, tell us! Well, in short, while visiting New York in the winter of 1902, during a trip on a city tram, she noticed that the driver was driving with the windscreen flaps open. The wind and snow not only hit the driver's face, but also all the passengers of the tram. But he couldn't close the flaps either, because then the visibility would be just zero, since the accumulated snow and rain could not be removed. And when she got home to Alabama, she immediately made these very wipers. No. She hired a constructor, who developed sketches of the manual windshield cleaner for her, according to which she made these wipers. No. A local company made a working model of the wiper on her order. Then why is she the creator? Because she was the one who filled an application, and in 1903 she received a patent for a windshield wiper. Well done, woman! Keep it up, smart lady! The wiper consisted of a lever inside the car that controlled a rubber brush on the outside of the windshield. To ensure contact between the wiper and the window, a spring was used. And with the help of a lever, the spring-loaded brush could be moved from left to right along the windshield. Even though similar devices had been made before, the Mary Anderson windscreen wiper was the first to function effectively. Then she wanted to sell her patent because everyone thought that her invention had no commercial value. Are they stupid or something? As a result, 20 years later, well, after the expiration of the patent, the production of cars began to grow, and Cadillac became the first to install Mary Anderson windscreen as standard equipment on all of its cars. That's how all the cars are now equipped with windscreen wipers that were invented by a woman. Well, not really. Those wipers we see now were worked out and patented by the American pianist and composer Joseph Hoffman, who based their operation on the principle of a metronome. Anyway, the first wiper was invented by a woman. Yeah, a great addition to a car, which was invented by men. What? I say that's all for today. You were watching me, Brock from the Broccoli Academy. Thank you for your attention. So what, guys? Did you learn something new? Or as always, you were aware of all this? Well, scribble in the comments how many stories of these inventions you were aware of and how many you heard for the first time. Well, and as always, I'm waiting for your likes, subscriptions and shares. If you liked it, of course.